Welcome back. And a reminder that we are live. Have you ever had the urge to quit your job, take a trip, buy that sports car, or maybe even have an affair? Well, perhaps in years past, people would go, oh, you're having a midlife crisis. But I I'm here to say I think that's a grotesque oversimplification. Um, these are cho choices, and they are driven by something perhaps more like our own biology. This is a time of transformation, and it's something that people are going through more reliable, more readily. That is to say, we're more likely to reach our middle ages and reach far beyond that, and we're not really preparing for that. Joining me to have this conversation is clinical psychologist Michelle Golland and her husband Michael Golland. They're here to talk about their midlife. Should we call it a crisis? We call, call it something, <laughs> something that affected the relationship. A midlife deeply. situation. Situation. I How like that? that. I like that. Yes. Also, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. David Buss, professor of psychology at the University of Texas. He is the author of Evolution of Desire, a book I recommend very highly. And Thomas Plant, professor of psychology at Santa Clara University. He's the author of the recently published article, Is the Midlife Crisis an Excuse for Men Behaving Badly? And Dr. Christ, excuse me, Dr. Plant, I will send that question to you. Is it? I think often it is. Obviously, there are many different factors that may play a role in terms of how someone gets to this place where they have a midlife crisis. But nowadays, sometimes people look at a midlife crisis almost as if it is an inevitable disease or something, blame it on that, when what really is going on, perhaps, at least in a number of people, is narcissism, poor impulse control, and perhaps a, la a lack of ethics. And, and, well, let's leave off the lack of ethics because that's sort of a non-clinical thing for you and I. And, mm -hmm. and just address the narcissism, the impulse control. Those are certainly pandemic issues in our culture, in our society, in our population, wouldn't you say? You betcha. It seems like we live in a more and more narcissistic environment here in America. We have a lot of models for that in our Hollywood celebrities, our sports stars, our politicians, and so forth. And certainly impulse control is uh, true as well. Have it now. Why wait? You deserve it. The, these kinds of messages. And so this does seem to be part and parcel of our uh, culture. And before I get to Michelle and Michael, sorry, I want to have to ask Dr. Buss. Um, so we have poor impulse control. Is that of um, uh, biological processes that are sort of evolutionarily dialed into us? Well, I think there are a couple things going on. First, I think that we do, both men and women, have an evolved desire for sexual variety. And so these are, this is part of our nature. Whether we act on that desire, though, or those desires, depends on both, as you say, our personality characteristics, narcissism, sense of entitlement, impulse control, but also our marital situation or our relationship situation. Uh, in particular, I would point to uh, mate value discrepancies. In other words, uh, when someone experiences, either a man or a woman, a sudden boost in status, uh, then the, a discrepancy in mate value arises between the two partners. The higher mate value person typically feels more entitled to have an affair or to seek gratification elsewhere. I, I would say, Dr. Buss, that's another way of saying that guys should do their screwing around when they're younger and once they make a commitment, uh, really live by that commitment, even if they're what you call mate valuation. I think it's sort of their, their value to other onlookers, I guess we're talking about, that somebody becomes more attractive to other people. But but let me let me take yes. it now to Michael and Michelle, to a real-life relationship. Yes. And what I'm building a case of, well, all that I believe is true, what, what our psychologists have just said, the real-life situation that I think you and I encounter in clinical life, and Absolutely. now you guys have actually had to face down in your own life, right. is that middle life is a stressful time that we don't necessarily prepare for, and it comes to bear on a marital relationship that is trying to survive a lifetime. Absolutely. I think that's that's the issue and that's why uh, we felt it important to come and talk about this issue is that you know we weren't taught how to have long-term monogamous relationships and they're challenging. But uh, Dr. Buss would argue they're perhaps uh, aren't aren't natural from an evolutionary well, perspective. And I agree. I mean, we could talk about that, but uh, just as he said, it's really about variety and, and all of that that keeps a sexual life w what, going. what happened to you guys? What happened? For us, what happened was we were in a situation where my father had passed away a year ago, and it really was sort of a what would you, a perfect storm of, yeah. of a of situation where he also had a crisis in his family. Mm -hmm. And what happened in our marriage was 
we started to, and I, I'm a relationship expert. This is what I do. But again, I'm in my own grief. He's in his own kind of grief. And we did what happens and we see is we started to turn away. Drift apart. To, to, yeah, drift apart, but, but really just no longer see the value in each other of support and what we needed. We were sort of, again, getting through it, right? We have two little kids, a parent that just died, dealing with all of that. Right. Yeah, it was just, our marriage was strained. So for me personally, I was looking to have, you know, happier times outside of the house. I you were looking to feel better. Yeah. I mean, let's, I just wanted, I did not cheat. Let's just get that out of the way. So. <laughs> but, but, you, but you were heading that direction. But I was, yeah, I was definitely heading that direction. Yeah. I was looking for more fun in my life. You know, home life was not fun. So that was where I was headed. Well, and I have to say, I also, our first couple session back in into couples therapy to, uh, around this crisis, I said to, to our therapist, I'm afraid I could cheat. I never had felt those feelings because I had felt so alone because we have had and survived. I mean, we, we have 18 years of marriage. We've been together 23 years. I'm 42. He's 46. Five. 45. <laughs> How dare you, Michelle? <laughs> How dare you? It's a really <laughs> long time. But it's, it's really important that you under, that, that when, even when you feel like you have inoculated your marriage and you're, you have survived a lot of things, you still have to be able to see when you're in distress and when your partner's in distress so that yeah. you don't have the nuclear bomb of an affair. Yeah. And I would go back to Dr. Buss. I mean, when you take it down to the specifics of a given relationship, isn't it these same forces that begin to emerge that you were talking about? Yes, uh, I think it is. I mean, I, I think it's important to recognize that we all have desires and whether we act on them or not is a function of both personality and circumstance. I don't think it should be used as an excuse. So no one, you know, a man shouldn't go out have an affair and say, well, honey, I couldn't help it. My, my genes or my evolved desire for sexual variety made me do it. Uh, we do have personal choice and personal responsibility over these factors. And Dr. Plant, isn't that the very much the point of your article? Yeah, it really is. I think Dr. Buss uh, um, articulated it quite well, that regardless of our impulses and regardless of our desires, we have choice as to how we act on those uh, desires. Uh, just because you have a itch doesn't mean you have to scratch it. And Dr. Plant, you mentioned the issue of values, which we have skated around this whole conversation, but thank God Michael has shared a value with Michelle of the commitment right. they made to each other ask for help and this is what drives me crazy about this topic is we make a commitment in front of God and everybody and oh well I just my biology got the better of me I really like what Dr. Buss says I think that is a complete cop-out when men do that and if they didn't do it when they were younger when you're supposed to be a screwball well I'm sorry you didn't get you you had children you lost the team you made a commitment and that Dr. Plant I think is one of the the big points you all are making here and um so I want to keep this conversation going a little bit. I got some calls on this, I even believe. So there's some Facebook questions. So stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. And we've been talking about the midlife crisis, so-called. We were talking with Michelle and Michael Golland, a couple who saw the signs of Michael's... <sighs> What do we call it, midlife event? What do we call midlife it? Midlife situation. Midlife situation. And I have to say, we also have them, too. You keep talking well, about affairs and yeah. women and no, women. just men. I mean, we have that same. Well, that's why I want to change the terminology yeah. because it, it's just midlife comes with added stressors that we really don't prepare people Wait, for. and our generation is different because our generation is dealing with young kids at the same time as losing aging parents. Or caretaking of aging and parents. And caretaking which is aging very parents. And, and it's really, you know, we talk about narcissism and we talk yeah. about all these things, and we know clinically, and, and, and both of these gentlemen are brilliant and, and it's right on. But in the real world, what we have to realize is that we're dealing with people who are, are struggling with money and struggling with yes. kids and struggling yes. with all of these things. And they turn away not only for pleasure, but just to avoid. Yes, well, to, to feel avoid better. And to, to feel, feel better, better. That's what Michael's talking about. Yeah. All right, let me take a question. It's a Facebook question from Stephanie. It says, it's not a midlife crisis. It's male menopause. My ex-husband is going through it and has been for three or four years. He stopped paying bills. Every one of them got hooked on porn, all kinds of 
and Craigslist. Oh, jeez. Then he had us evicted from our home, and when that happened, he abandoned me and my two daughters. Um, Dr. Plant, I want to go to you because that is not a midlife crisis to me. That is depression with porn addiction. I mean, those are diagnosable conditions right. that happen to occur during midlife. Right. That is a good uh, uh, ob observation that we may attribute it to midlife crisis, but it could be a variety of things, including a variety of psychiatric uh, disorders or other troubles. And usually things are not simple. Usually things are complex and have layers to them. And so that uh, we need to kind of investigate a little bit more thoughtfully about what might be contributing to this person's uh, right. behavior. And Delian writes, many men are foolish enough to believe they never lose their appeal. They're foolish to believe a younger woman is after them because of themselves, not of what they've surrounded them with. However, the midlife crisis also affects women. Just look around. Women chasing dreams. Also very sad. Um, Dr. Buss, I want to point out, by the way, also Dr. Buss wrote a book called Why Women Have Sex, as well as a book called The Evolution of Desire. Both books I just recently completed, which is why I asked you to be on the program this evening. Um, isn't yeah. that uh, symptomatic of what you were talking about, where men increase their status and increase their resources and then think that young women are attracted to them because, hey, they're just, they're just hot dudes? Uh, absolutely. And one, I mean, one of the things is, I mean, we evolved in a context where status did matter. Status was an important component of a man's desirability. And so when men do experience a, a, a bump in status, a sudden increase in status, the fact is they do become more desirable, but as you say, it's not necessarily because of who they are, but it's because of those external accoutrements. And, and there's a lot more to this conversation with older women now, with younger men, and that's a, a separate condition I see. But I think the testosterone issue is an important one. And the menopause issue, but that is grist for another day, I'm afraid. Thank you guys for joining us. Those are very important, by the way, and not addressed enough. Uh, I, I, I want to thank Dr. Plant and Dr. Buss, also, of course, Michelle and Michael Gollin for sharing their story with us. And I said, your menopause, hormone replacement, I'm a big fan of that because as our biology changes, it affects the, the brain, it affects the psychology, it affects our relationships. Men and their lowering testosterone, the biology matters, and we don't attend to it enough. We certainly don't educate people about it. But again, that's for another show. I want to thank you for watching tonight. I'll see you next time. <laughs>